I want you to hit me as hard as you can. If you ask anyone what the most popular car in pop culture history is, you will probably get one of three answers. The Batmobile, the DeLorean, and of course, Kit. Personally, I think the ultimate car in pop culture history is the DeLorean, but the second car I love the most is the sentient Pontiac Firebird Trans Am with the name Night Industries 2000, or Kit for short. God, I wanted this car so much when I was a kid. I just thought it was so cool. It was fast, it drove itself, and it talked. The Adventures of Kit were of course featured on one of the coolest shows of the 1980s, Knight Rider. Ah, uh, Knight Rider, how I love you. Not only did you feature awesome car stunts and give us fun stories, but best of all, you gave us the Hoth. Yes, one of the most beloved actors in the world, David freaking Hasselhoff. We love how corny he is and how he can make fun of himself, whether it comes from some of his acting choices or some of his albums. Not only is he an actor and a singer, but in the past few years, the Hoff has practically become a brand. Whenever I see David Hasselhoff is involved in a project, I immediately know I am going to have a good time. Even in crap movies like the Baywatch remake, I knew I would get one redeeming scene with the David Hasselhoff cameo, although the rest of that movie was still garbage. I know the first thing people associate Hasselhoff with is Baywatch, but a decade before Baywatch, he was cemented in the public consciousness through a show that featured an iconic theme song, a cool leather jacket, and a shining mullet in all of its glory. But is it awesome as I say? Is the mullet really that shiny? Should we see Kit racing in the desert once again? And will we hear that classic theme song once more? Let us find out in this episode of Gone, but not forgotten. Knight Rider aired from 1982 to 1986 on NBC. It was created by the infamous writer, musician, director, and producer Glenn A. Larson. Larson was a staple of TV in the 1980s as the co-creator of so many classic TV shows, such as Magnum P.I., BJ and the Bear, and Buck Rogers. But he is probably best known as the man who created the groundbreaking Battlestar Galactica. However, Larson was also a controversial figure in television, as he was accused of plagiarism quite often. One infamous story even involves him getting punched in the face by James Garner. But regardless, Knight Rider has been remembered as one of his biggest shows, right next to Battlestar. And you can trace the origin of Knight Rider all the way back to... Brandon Tartikoff. Dear Lord, I cannot escape this man! It's like every amazing show that I cover on this series can be traced back to Brandon Tartikoff. I don't want to say that this man was a television god, but this is yet another incident of Tartikoff impacting the development of television for future generations. Anyway, Tartikoff ordered a show with the idea of a hero with a supercar. So the race was on, with NBC contacting Universal and having them commission a pilot. But there was a problem. The executives at Universal were terrified of a talking car, as they were still traumatized from the mid-60s when they had commissioned My Mother the Car, one of the most embarrassing shows in television history. For those who were fortunate enough to miss it, the show's title says it all. A man's mother is reincarnated into a car. I've seen it myself, and it is truly embarrassingly bad. In fact, I don't think that I've ever seen anything worse on television. Heil, honey. Heil, honey. Heil, honey. Heil, honey. Mm, I stand corrected. So Universal had to find someone to make this show. They had to make sure that they had someone who had produced hit shows for them in the past. Enter Glenn Larson, who had produced hit after hit with Universal. But there was a problem. He was unhappy working for Universal. So much so that he sold the rights to all of his shows to Universal for one dollar to get out of his contract a year early to go to 20th Century Fox. 
Again, I want to point out here that he sold the rights to Buck Rogers, Magnum P.I., and Battlestar Galactica, one of the best TV shows of all time, for one dollar. <laughs> So how would they get Larson to develop this show? Well, it was easy. They put the caveat that Larson had to develop one more show before he left Universal. Now this show was in his lap and he had to create it fast. And Larson had two words in his mind, Lone Ranger. If you think about it, the Lone Ranger has a pretty brilliant plot structure to base a show upon. A mysterious hero strolls into town with his faithful steed, saves the day, and leaves to repeat the process the next week. It's a universal concept that everybody can identify with. Larson went to Hawaii and wrote the script in 10 days, then came back and shot the pilot. And the studio immediately began to try and interfere. They didn't want the car to talk. Then they changed their mind and wanted a sexy woman's voice for the car instead. And get this, they did not think that Hasselhoff was leading man material. What the fuck? Blasphemy! Thankfully, Larson put his foot down. Hasselhoff would stay, and they would have to leave the pilot as it was, which is exactly what they did. For the voice of Kit, Larson pictured something along the lines of HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey, and he only had one choice for the voice of Kit, William Daniels. A lot of you younger folks may know him as Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World, but at the time, Daniels was already a huge television star who had been working in TV since the 50s. I actually remember him from reruns of this goofy old show called Captain Nice. And at the time of Knight Rider, he was already working on Saint Elsewhere when he was approached to do the voice of Kit. In interviews decades later, he said that at first, he had a hard time grasping the concept of a talking car. But once he decided to use his regular voice instead of the robot voice he was asked to do, he nailed it. Fun fact for you, Daniels asked to not be credited, as he wanted to not ruin the illusion of a talking car for viewers. Can you believe that? An actor not wanting to take credit for a hit role? That in itself is the most amazing thing about this show, in my opinion. The pilot episode premiered on NBC on September 26, 1982, and was a big hit. It was able to thrive against its competition, Dallas, which was the biggest show of the time. It was then moved to Friday nights at 8pm, where it came second in the ratings just under another groundbreaking show, MASH. The show proved so popular that they aired the two-hour pilot three times that season. And thanks to Knight Rider, NBC was no longer in third place against the other networks. The first episode begins with Detective Michael Long, who while undercover is betrayed by his informant who has his partner killed. Then she tricks him into going to a remote location where she shoots him in the face. Luckily, his life is saved by an eccentric billionaire named Wilton Knight, who gives Long a new face. That bad? Well, you do look like David Hasselhoff, but with many years of running down the beach in slow motion, you'll soon find yourself living a normal life again. Michael Long is given the new identity of Michael Knight, and is given a supercar, Knight Industries 2000, or Kit for short. Much to his amazement, Kit is a sentient car that can talk for itself. And the car that portrayed Kit was a modified 1982 Pontiac Trans Am. Larson was drawn to this car, though he had no idea why, and got the first three of them off the assembly line. To make it futuristic, he gave it the Cylon helmet laser from Battlestar Galactica, and then he hired Michael Sheff to design the interior of Kit with one instruction, make it like Darth Vader. What's interesting is how Kit would eventually predict what the future of the car industry would look like. Kit had features like GPS, wireless car phones, self-parking, and many others that are now standard in cars nowadays. We'll get back to Kit later, but for now, let's get back to the plot of the pilot. Michael winds up tracking down the woman who betrayed him at the beginning of the show, Tanya Walker. While he's there, he enters a demolition derby that she happens to be sponsoring. 
While he's in the race, he discovers that Buddy, the young son of a woman who was helping him to take down Tanya, has stowed himself away in the car. Although Michael has nothing to worry about, since Kit easily overtakes the other cars in the derby. There is a bit of a hiccup, though, as a side effect of one of Kit's features is momentarily turning Michael into an overweight stuntman and Buddy into a mannequin. In all seriousness, though, the car stunts on this show were amazing. Jack Gill was the stunt coordinator, and he would go on to work on films such as the Bad Boys and Fast and Furious franchises. You don't really see car stunts like this on TV anymore, which is a real shame because the stunts on Knight Rider were awesome to watch. Anyway, the pilot ends with Michael finding justice for his partner and dedicating his life to fighting crime with Kit. I have to say that it's an amazing pilot that had just the right balance of action and compelling storytelling, which not a lot of pilot episodes can pull off. The supporting cast of Knight Rider was led by Edward Mulhair as Devin Miles. Devin was the Alfred to Michael's Batman. At first, he is annoyed by Michael because of his flippant attitude, but eventually, he learns to respect him. And as the series progressed, Devin began to see Michael like a son. And Mulhair was a great actor, who'd also been acting since the 50s, with an impressive filmography that included co-starring alongside Orson Welles in his 1952 adaptation of Othello. I can't explain it, but he is one of those few actors who could deliver exposition in such a way that you weren't bored by it or jarred out of the scene while it was being delivered. Patricia McPherson played the role of Dr. Bonnie Barstow, Kit's technician and the love interest for Michael. McPherson had some amazing chemistry with Hasselhoff, and it comes across in the show as the two of them have a bit of a will-they-or-won't-they -they subplot. But they were also friends, and Bonnie had no problem standing up to Michael whenever she felt he was in the wrong. McPherson sadly left the show briefly in Season 2 after falling out with one of the producers, and got herself replaced by Rebecca Holden as technician April Curtis. April sucked. I'm sorry, but she did. I had the same feelings for her as when they replaced Dr. Beverly Crusher with Dr. Catherine Pulaski. Such boring characters. She did not have much of a personality other than having sex appeal, and I know this is gonna sound mean, but Rebecca Holden just came off like a pageant contestant instead of a technician. The fans were pissed by her replacing McPherson, Mulhair and Hasselhoff were ticked off as well, and pressured the producers to bring her back, which is what they thankfully did in Season 3. Now, there are so many great episodes of Knight Rider that I can talk about here. My favorite episode, Trust Doesn't Rust, introduces the most popular villain of the show, Carr, an evil version of Kit who is voiced by Peter Cullen, aka the voice of... Do not grieve. Soon, I shall be one with the Matrix. Yeah, Optimus freaking Prime! In fact, Carr's voice sounds like an evil version of Optimus. It's pretty fun to see these two cars going at it, especially during their showdown at the end of the episode. Kit, I am warning you. Change course at once. I am not in control, Carr. Then tell the humans to turn away. This is his folly, Kit. He's right. He's right. No way. Michael, what are you doing? Remember Zeno and that immovable object thing? We're about to find out the answer. You've got the touch! You've got the power! Yeah! One shall stand, one shall fall. No! And Cullen would wind up doing the voice of Carr in all but one of Carr's appearances in the Knight Rider franchise. Another fan favorite episode named Goliath featured Garth Knight, the estranged son of Wilton Knight. <laughs> Garth, God, what a stupid name. You didn't tell him about my pubes, did you? Garth is a master criminal who happens to have Michael's face, or rather, Michael has Garth's face. 
Look, I know this guy is supposed to look like a Mirror Universe Spock, but whenever I look at him, I just think that he looks like a pimp. I'm not a pimp! It's not my favorite episode of the series, but it has some interesting moments, such as Pimp Knight's reaction to his father giving Michael his face. Man, that is pretty messed up when your father hates you so much, he would rather have someone else wearing your face. As the seasons progressed, Kit began to get more gadgets, and this is where the show started to lose me. The essential part of the show was the chemistry between Hasselhoff and Daniels. They were so good, even though they weren't even in the same room together. A script girl would have to read Daniels' lines off-screen to Hasselhoff, and then Daniels would record his reactions based off of Hasselhoff's footage. The two men didn't even meet until the Christmas party for the cast in the first season. Hasselhoff said that he was weirded out when he met Daniels, as he had only heard his voice when he saw the show at home, so it was kind of like meeting a car in human form. But starting with season 3, the show started to take a turn for me, as there were more action-based stories as opposed to a good balance of action and character-based episodes. Also, I felt the network made a huge mistake when they began to tinker with Kit by making him into practically a Transformer, adding rockets and other crap. I for one felt like keeping Kit simple was the best feature of the show. It kept it more grounded in my opinion. After that, it just seemed silly. By season 4, the writing was on the wall. The popularity of the show started to die down, and the ratings reflected that. The last episode would air on May 27th, 1986, although true Knight Rider fans will agree that the true spiritual finale was the episode that aired earlier in the season, called The Scent of Roses. Hasselhoff helped make this episode, which involves Michael getting married to a new lover, only to have his new wife killed and leading him to avenge her death. In the end, Michael has himself a moment of self-reflection, then gets in the kit, and rides home for another adventure on the horizon. A far better ending for a truly great show. So once again we ask, should this show come back? Well, yes and no. There have been many attempts to revive the show over the years, with TV movies and horrible follow-ups, with the 1994 TV movie Knight Rider 2010 being a particular abomination. Before his death, Larson stated that the problem with these newer Knight Riders was that they never focused on the relationship between one man and one machine. They either tried to make a team of heroes like in Team Knight Rider, or focusing more on Michael like in the 2008 reboot. I don't think Knight Rider could work on TV again. There wouldn't be that many great stunts like back in the 80s. However, making it into a movie would completely work. The Fast and Furious franchise has shown that people love car stunts and fun stories. And for over a decade, a Knight Rider movie has actually been in the works, with such big name stars as Ben Affleck attached to it. But previous treatments have not stayed faithful to the show. A few years ago, some producers wanted to make it into a comedy, like 21 Jump Street. But just this past year, news broke that Furious 7 director James Wan is at the helm and working with Mega Knight Rider fan TJ Fixman to bring Kit onto the big screen, with the endorsement of the Hoff himself. So who knows, we may see Michael and Kit barreling down that desert once again. But if not, the show will always have a place in the fans' hearts, as well as one kick-ass theme song. If you're interested in driving down memory lane, you can watch the series for yourself on Peacock or just buy the DVDs. I highly suggest you do. Great entertainment is only a short drive away. <laughs> Night Rider, a shadowy flight into the dangerous world of a man that does not exist. I'm Jesse 
Casey Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com. And thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company that appreciates all of your support. And we will see you next time for the next installment of Gone But Not Forgotten.